Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. Our website is horusrising.com. I'm Alan Peoples, again, joined by Patricia Awion Lehman. Hi, Patricia. Hey, Alan. <laughs> okay, well, we're still on the theme of the cycles of uh, rising and falling awareness, cycles of consciousness. Get started. So we're going to go into something really cool just to get started. And we may as well just get started, right? Um, <laughs> This is an amazing image in um, it's it's the uh, chapel or chamber of Sokar in at Dendera, the Temple of Hathor. Dendera is just jam packed with information, universal knowings, um, and this this one is this image that speaks to all of the cycles that I, I talked about in our la our last uh, episode um, in in just one beautiful image. Um, and uh, I call it the journey of the eye in the sky because <laughs> um, what we're really looking at here um, is these these two figures are you know Tolka Jehuti as the ibis bird you can see him standing and on the, on the other side uh, well yeah on the left sorry um, and on the other side you see Shu and together they're holding what I call the field of vision. We see the eye in the center. It's that field of vision, what we're consciously um, perceiving, right? Right, it looks like a car um, windscreen that they're holding up. It does, doesn't it? I, I've always thought the same thing. Now, when I've researched this and, and read other, other people's um, white papers about this, um, it's been also called the net, uh, and I'll talk about this in a moment. Um, but it's literally, it is the field of vision. It's, it's how we're perceiving reality, right? So this is, this is a whole image that explains this, right? In a nutshell again. Well, funny nutshell. Um, the image over top of that field of vision is uh, a bar. And that bar is a hieroglyph that uh, means pet, which is basically the heavens or the Milky Way above. And on the far left, you see this image of Horus, right? There's the hawk, and he's on this, this lotus or papyrus pillar that has fallen 23.5 degrees, like the axis of the earth falling, right? Um, really fascinating. So, and above him, you see an image of a scarab or a kepper beetle, and the scarab is going to push the sun across the heavens. And I'm going to show you in an upcoming presentation the whole symbolism of the Kepper beetle. But this is what they use to show, again, another imagery for showing the cycles of consciousness, the ages and stages of, of the breath of life. So as he pushes it across and we go to the other side, we see an image of Toph as the baboon. And this you know, Toph is the baboon is wisdom from within. We talked about this before. Toph is the ibis bird is wisdom from above. But wisdom from within as the baboon, the baboon is sitting on an erect pillar, right? And the pillar is above him. You're seeing an image of it's basically a full moon. Um, and again, this is another symbol they use, the stages of the moon waxing and waning is another way they use symbolism to refer to these stages of evolving and devolving consciousness. Mm -hmm. So here you're, you're watching this happen. As we hit that highest stage again, and you go back down to the bottom, you see these two ibis birds, also consciousness. Toth is, is Toth Jehuti is consciousness, right? So you see them walking back where? To falling out of balance again. So you're seeing this cycle or circle of life and it's happening continuously over and over again, falling into and out of balance, falling into separation consciousness and moving back into unity consciousness. Um, and he's sitting there on that perfectly erect pillar, lotus or papyrus pillar, and he's in that moment of gnosis, knowing, wisdom from within. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful image to show what we've been talking about. And up in that upper, up, upper right-hand corner, I have an image. It's the name of Osiris. 
uh, whose name was uh, really pronounced with seer, right? Um, and you notice that the I is part of his name because the journey of Osiris is the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is this journey of moving into and out of this high state of consciousness, the eternal cycles, the eternal breath of life. So all these things we're going to talk about as we move further, but this image I just love that it has everything packed into one image. It's worth mentioning also that these images inside the temples were not meant to be seen by normal people. You didn't just go as a tourist and uh, you know read the walls. This is sacred knowledge that was kept hidden by- Absolutely, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, when we fell into the stage of Amun, the age of Amun, this is when the priests started to block off the um, entrances to the temples and they only allowed people into, you know, the general public into the outer courtyards. And we might have talked about this before. And then as, you know, the initiates that came to study at the temples only dependent on their level of awareness were they allowed into certain um certain areas of the temple and of course only the high priest was allowed in the uh, holy of holies so you're absolutely right alan um we are fortunate to get into the temples today and experience this and as i said i believe this is the time when you know the, i actually think this is the time that the symbolism was made for mm. um and they kept it hidden from us because there's, they have so much powerful knowledge contained within them that we probably weren't of a state of consciousness that could handle what it is that they have to tell us. But again, two ways of looking at the same thing. I still don't like that it was hidden from me <laughs> because I always <laughs> want to know more. <laughs> so the net, I, I wanted, since we brought that you know, I brought that topic up. I wanted to show you an image of what one of these nets looks like and to show you the concept of what it is. Because, I, I, you know, I saw these everywhere in Egypt. You know, we see them in the tombs. And this is actually from a wall at the Temple of Horus at Edfu. Isn't it gorgeous? Um, and you see it, it literally is a net. And it's holding in, you see all kinds of animals and birds. Um, and at the bottom, you see hostages held hostage, right? So this is perception that that last image that we saw is showing you perception held hostage, right? Within a container, you know, we are, we are veiled. This is the net that veils us from our truth. Funny that we were just talking about that. So. And, and what is the net, you know, in our lives now? It's, it's electronic. It's, it's a magnetic uh, field. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is being used as a tool in so many different ways. Uh, and again, we were just talking about this a little while ago that, you know, the, the, the information's out there and so many different ways, at least, <laughs> so many different dual opposing stories. And we have to go within to determine our truths, don't we? Um, incredible. So I said that the moon was used as a symbol. Uh, the, the waning and the waxing stages of the moon was used as a metaphor for these stages and ages of consciousness. Um, and this is an incredible image that you see on the ceiling of the Temple of Esna. Uh, it's the Temple of Kanum, uh, who actually builds or fashions the, the two bodies, the form, the bond, the and, and the ka. Um, but anyway, we're looking at it. They just, they're just in the process of cleaning this temple now. And what's emerging is just beyond, uh, ah, it's, it's, it's beyond exquisite and beautiful, but we're finding, they're finding symbols and things they hadn't seen before. So, uh, it's, it's just been an incredible process. And there are, I think they're halfway through now. Um, and I just can't wait to get back again, but this imagery has always just totally fascinated me because you see the stages of the moon expressed as, you can see the eye, there's the eye of, of Ra, right? Reflected in the moon, because again, we are the shadow uh, in, in the, <laughs> of what's real in the space in between. The reflected light of the sun is, is what we see in the moon. 
Um, and this I, it's the I that starts to become fractions, right? Which they later used, the fractions of this I, they used as tools for measurement, right? Mm -hmm. Mathematics. Um, but what we're seeing is full-blown consciousness, the full moon as the full I, and then we start to lose, you know, it becomes separated aspects of the whole. Um, just incredible way of presenting this whole idea of how we evolve and devolve. And on the bottom, you're actually seeing this, this lowest state of consciousness I have the, uh, on the left side is uh, an image of Osiris and he's mummified, right? He's, he's held hostage, you know, within his own wings, you know, um, wrapped in his own wings, earthbound, and there is no eye in the moon at all, right? But as we rise into fullness, you can see we, again, you see the full eye in the red circle on the far right, and that's an image of Toth sitting in his power, and he's holding the eye in his hand. Isn't that just beautiful? Full-blown consciousness released right from the container. Um, really beautiful. Um, and you can't miss the metaphor, can you? It's incredible, really. Isn't it? <laughs> and there's so much within this. I would like to talk about all of it. Look at the currency. Look at, look at the... The lion's gate. It's just so many things here, but we're just going to keep going and get into it. We'll get to it. Exactly. Um, just beautiful. And same, same exact metaphor, metaphorical idea presented on the ceiling at Dendera in the Temple of Hathor. And you see these 14 uh, netters and they're moving up, right up the steps. They're moving up into the full moon which is the mirror, it's Hathor's mirror. And the eye in the full moon, this full-blown consciousness, is still the reflected consciousness, right? So it's in a way, it's telling us that everything we perceive is, is a mirror of ourselves. We're looking in the mirror, right? Um, incredibly powerful. So, you know, the whole temple speaks to these ages and stages of consciousness, and it shows you on the ceiling, the whole ceiling shows you an expression of the hero's journey from the night cycle into the day cycle and how we flip back into another cycle. And that you walk to this, to this one image and you see this understanding that it's all a reflection of you. Everything we perceive is something, you know, that we have created in our imaginings, right? Mm -hmm. Powerful, powerful. Um, just amazing. And of course, behind this mirror is um, an image of Toth again, and he's standing on the birthing box. The, um, it, it, in a way, it, it's a portal between heaven and earth. Um, just, just really beautiful imagery. Um, and <laughs> I point out here, um, one of the, the important things in understanding Hathor uh, and Ra is, we, we see he has two eyes, right? Well, he has one eye, but there is a story about Ra where he takes his eye um, and it becomes Hathor, and it's the nurturing rays of the sun. And it, you know, the sun as we know it feeds us. We need the sun. You know, when the pandemic hit, we were told to get out in the sun, it'll, it'll help keep us healthy. Uh, I ran right to the beach. Um, so it's the nurturing rays of the sun that heal us. But in, you know, when he takes that eye out and it becomes Hathor, he takes it out in a moment of rage because um, Earth, the people of Earth had fallen out of Ma'at of balance. They weren't revering the Neturu, the forces of nature. And he takes that eye and in his anger, it becomes Sekhmet, right? So the two sides and that, you know, in his rage, it's, you know, Sekhmet comes down and she scourges the earth. It's the fierce rays of the sun um, and that basically destroy. It's the, it causes the earthquakes, the volcanoes, the, you know, the mass destruction um, that in a way uh, is the destruction like Kali that destroys in order to heal. Um, it clears the way for creation. Exactly. So again, speaking to these two sides of the cycle, 
Um, and we're going to get much more into this as we move along because the whole story of Sekhmet speaks to so many levels of the cycle. Um, and when he sees that she's almost destroyed the earth, he turns the water, the Nile, into wine. Um, and she looks, she sees it, and she, she's bloodthirsty with rage, and she drinks the, the, the Nile, the waters of the Nile, the wine, because she thinks it's blood, and she becomes um, inebriated and passes out. And um, she passes out for a moment of silence. It's three days. And after three days, she wakes up again. Now, on an annual year, those three days are the winter and summer solstices, right? Those, those three days where we don't uh, experience the days getting longer or shorter. Um, and then, you know, when, when after the, those three days of the solstice, we celebrate what? Uh, we celebrate, well, back then they celebrated the new year at the summer solstice. And today we celebrate the new year after the winter solstice. Mm. Um, how we flip things, um, but we did we did we did that a lot, and that again has to do with flipping the the metaphor within the symbolism. All more things we're going to get to, but, but this is all a natural process. This is something that happens again and again and again in cycles and cycles and cycles. Exactly, over Not and over. Fault of our own. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The nature of humanity. And right now, I just want to present this so, you know, how it, it, it is embodied in so many different methods in the symbolism. And again, this is worldwide, but our focus here is on, on Egypt. Um, and sunrise, again, I find this fascinating, but sunrise was known as Sa-Ra, the birth of the sun. And again, these alignments that were so important um, at activating the inert, you know, as the sun rises, <coughs> what is inert to begin a new cycle. And I find it fascinating that, you know, sunrise, um, the birth of a new cycle is Sarah, it is Sarah, right? Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, and we already mentioned that the obelisk was Ibra, right? A beam from the heart of the sun. So we have Ibrahim and Sarah already represented within the understanding of the ancients, the cycles of life. And then the lotus, the blue lotus, or just the lotus, a powerful, powerful symbol in ancient Egypt that also speaks to these cycles. Um, the blue, the Egyptian blue lotus or water lily was called session. Um, and in one of the ancient crea creation myths, Ra or the sun was born out of the blue lotus flower, which was considered to be a womb, right? There we go again, a beautiful womb. Rising from its petals as it opened after the emerging, after emerging from the primordial waters or the sea of two knives. This is going to be important in a moment. The blue lotus, which became a symbol for the sun, dips its head beneath the water each evening when the sun sets, only to arise with the sun rays each morning. Its petal, petals following the sun's path in the sky each day. As such, it also reflects the stages or cycles of the sun that mirror universal cycles, as we've, we've been talking about. Um, and the other fascinating thing about the lotus is, you know, it, its process embodies the four elements. It has its roots in the earth, right? And its mm -hmm. stem comes up through the water. And its leaves and flowers open out into the air to receive the celestial dew of the sun's rays. It gives birth to the sun, which is fire, right? So again, it's a beautiful symbol of all of these cycles um, and, you know, and so much more. And you can see the fiery sun right there in the center of the lotus. I mean, it's so evident. Um, and it be also becomes a symbol for the sun uh, and, of course, the cycles of the sun. And here on the right, you see this wonderful image of the lotus giving birth to the four sons of Horus, which represented those four elements or the four directions, uh, the four cardinal directions, if you will, as again, a first breath of life from the, the point, right? That point of singularity giving breath to form, it's going to breathe out into the four directions. Um, and then six.
where we get the term the flowering of life um, and one of Alan's favorite symbols, the flower of life, <laughs> based on again this this lotus. It's it's the seed of life, the flowering of life. Um, the image in the upper right hand corner is um, Nefertum, and Nefertum represents the harmony of the atom. Um, and we're going to talk about that. It's the beginning of a new cycle, a new day cycle. Um, and I love that lotus bowl. There's several of them uh, you'll find in different museums. And in the center of this one, you can see an image that almost looks like a swastika. And it's basically representing the spin because creation starts with separation and a spin, right? We spin mm -hmm. to create the magnetic field, right? Um, and a new breath of life. And it's again, it's a universal symbol. It's it's you see it in many different places. It's a powerful symbol in Australia. Um, this other image from India, Krishna city seated in a lotus blossom. Um, Horus is consciousness rising. There's Tutankhamun on the far left, um, coming out of the lotus bowl, giving birth to a new cycle. So here you have. Um, uh, the symbol of the four sons of Horus uh, next to this image of Brahma um, being born out of the lotus flower. Oh, and yeah, with, with four faces facing in each direction. Four, exactly. The four you see this exact direction. same iconography in Angkor Wat. Exactly. <laughs> so, Famously. yeah, it's, 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 it's no mistake. And, of course, lotuses uh, also represent the shock Ra's in, in um, the Hindu uh, imagery. Um, they're they're uh, imaged as lotus petals, little lotus suns, right? Within mm. us, opening. Um, oh, that's just, true. Just, yeah, it's a powerful, powerful symbol. Uh, even the back to back lotuses that we're going to talk about in the future. So, yeah. Um, here we have Raharakti, Horus of the Two Horizons, surrounded by the Ogdod, right? Um, there originally, there's not originally, there were eight Ogdod um, who were, um, each pair of the Ogdod represented the male and female aspects of the four creative powers or sources. It represents also an aspect of the primordial chaos out of which the world was created. It came into being at the same time. Now, the Ogdod speaks to, like, the, the energy of the universe being formed, where the Heliopolian uh, often, um, uh, creation myth is speaking more to the creation of physical and form uh, that, that we're, you know, closer to home. But this is a universal, like a total cosmos creation, if you will. Um, and so they came into being at the same time. Nun and Nunet represent the primordial waters. Kuk, Kuk and Kuk. Kuket represent the infinite darkness. He and Hegelet represent empty space. And Amun and Amunet represent quintessence or the secret powers of creation. I just want to mention that, interestingly, the modern Egyptian Arabic plural for ancestor, ancestors, is pronounced Agdad. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, literally the primordial ancestors. At the, the at ancestors the of us all. Hmm. Um, and I love this image of showing you the lotus uh, in the rising sun, right, on the horizon, the Akat. Um, and within that is also perception, um, a new cycle of perception. So the rising sun, again, new cycle, new cycle of perception coming out of the lotus. Um, and here's the Ogdot again. Um, I just, they're fascinating um, in how they're represented and where they pop into the different uh, mythologies um, and imagery in the temples. So again, you know, I, we have this, you know, new and newt are water. Um, uh, and I love this, that, you know, there's eight, create these cycles of, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that that beginning and end doesn't happen. It's not just earth-based, it's universal. It's, it's you know, the everything that we think is out there comes to an end and then begins again over and over and over again. 
So again, the primordial waters, uh, the nature of water gathering in the sky, the waveform sparked into motion with vibration. This is the beginning, vibration, sound, that's Hathor as well. Um, and the flow, the uh, hieroglyph there on the right is uh, the hieroglyph for N, and it's, you know, it's the up and down line, it's currency, it's water, it's energy, you know, it's all those things and more. Um, and then you have uh, Hei Hoi and Hei Huet, Hoyet, fire, the elements of fire and the sun, infinity, uh, in, infinity and the finite, endlessness of space, time and space, you know, they, they come into being when we have movement, when we have vibration. And Kekoi and Kekoyet, earth, the forces of darkness and the depths of the water, the night right before dawn and the night right after dusk. Fascinating. It's interesting because um, it seems like these are the electro, electric and magnetic properties of earth, air, fire, and water. Yes, Elec of course. Electric being, being the masculine, magnetic being the feminine. Exactly. In fact, I'm going to get into that very soon. Um, it's life force itself. That's that's mm -hmm. creation. It's the beginning of life force, and they're describing. This, this is the basis of everything. Exactly. Um, and these serpent-headed and frog-headed netters, you know, the frog representing, you know, the, you know, the tadpole, the, the prolific life aspect, and the serpent being that breath. Um, mm. Incredible. Um, and then you have Amun and Amunet, air, the hidden, inactive forces of nature, the asleep, you know, it's, it's the, the pulse, breath, or heartbeat before the activation of the sun, um, kind of like what, where we're at now, as we talked about. Um, but you're going to like this, Alan. What's really fascinating is if you take these, net, these netters um, in the beginnings of their names, you spell Ankh, the symbol of life. <laughs> <laughs> right? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. A N K H. Ankh. Wow. You know, it's it's the breath of life, and that's what I just described. So <laughs> fascinating. So I'm going to use this image a lot, um, but for now, I'm just going to point out. You know, here we're looking at the creation, right, of the cosmos as separation. But what's within there are eight, these eight Ogdod with mares, right? Mm -hmm. They have tools for opening a path for the, the plow, right? And you have these two netters. Um, they're netters. They're feminine. Um, that are literally dumping the waters, the two waters to create, right? What? That magnetic field, right? The veil for the beginning of life. Um, just incredible. However, Amante was the land of the dead. As we said, Amun, Amante, the land of the dead, the underworld or the hidden land. Um, and here you see an expression of it. It's the place where we perceive the earthly realm through limited physical senses. You see this image of um, the woman with the eye in her hands, you know, and that she's right in front of this uh, symbol of Amante, right? Uh, just totally Is this why you say that now we are in the night cycle rather than the day yes. cycle? Because exactly. we're experiencing the earth through limit senses rather than the full Plato's senses. Eight. Exactly, exactly. We are living in the hidden. We're we're born through the veil of forgetfulness, and we haven't. We don't see our truths. We 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 are viewing everything from limited and programmed senses, right? Mm. So yeah, that's why we did that the, the first uh, two presentations to speak about how we perceive the world because when we fully understand how limited we are, we can open our minds to the possibility that we weren't once weren't limited at all. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because they say, of course, the, the, the texts say that Amente had its rivers both of separation and punishment. So here we are again, separation consciousness and where we're held hostage um, and uh, we live in states of fear and anger mm. and therefore um, in a systemized environment they 
have the tools for punishment, right? That's, that's you know, when you're held hostage, it, it, it's about the warrior archetype. It's about, you know, yin against yang. Um, and uh, this is the mente. And this, of course, is where we're at now. Um, we are born into the womb of the night cycle and the dream world through the veil into separation consciousness. Um, and this image basically shows you this. And there you see an image of Ipet or Tarot, and she's um, holding her hand. One hand is on the mooring post, which is an image called the Sa, um, and it's about birth. And again, that's the mooring post for the spin that begins the active breath of life. Um, but you can see we have um, the mummified figure on the left, wrapped in his own wings, and the image of Hathor is the cow, the cosmic cow, sticking her head out of Amante, right? Her, her face is coming through the veil. <laughs> what did you say again about the face of Hathor being the face of humanity? Well, the face of Hathor, yeah, true. Um, on the ceiling, when uh, they show the birth of form, you see Hathor's face as basically the seed of form, and you come to realize that Nut is actually Hathor's hair. And this is why Hathor mm, is the Omega conduit between heaven and earth, because you know the face is form and her hair is the heavens, and so she is both. And she gives birth to form to as the life force, right? She creates. Um, through the birthing process. So, but yeah, we're going to get to that too. So, okay. You know, I just like to remind everyone that we do have uh, several tours during the year. I have one with Jocelyn, who you met in the first two sessions. She'll be back with us again soon. Um, it's a beautiful tour. Uh, wow, she's a great astrologer, and we're um, we're going to be going everywhere throughout Egypt with uh, lots of privates and special moments. Uh, we call that the Rise of the Winged Kepper Tour, uh, which relates to that next moving into that higher cycle of consciousness into the day cycle. And uh, right after that, in April, I um, am co-hosting a tour with Brian Forrester, where we delve into both ancient technologies and metaphysics. Um, and uh, it's, it's always special and fun, and we bring along uh, Susan Moore, who is a world-class Jurassic geologist, and she, she understands the rocks in ways she's, she's explained so many things that were actually, um, actually not understood correctly um, to begin with, like everyone calls most of the granite here red granite, pink granite, and she's pointed out that most of it is actually cyanite, and it's a really important thing to know because cyanite has more feldspar in it and less crystal. So uh, these are all very important <laughs> things, and like a, a lot of what we call alabaster is actually travertine. Exactly, exactly. Not the same thing. And when you understand, because these stones were chosen with huge energetic purposes in mind, then once you realize it's not what you thought it was, then you can look at what it really was used for and why it's there. So she's just fabulous and um, she's amazing. She does a great lecture, always brings something new to the table. So yeah, both tours are gonna be fantastic. Um, I have a new one coming up in February and I'm also thinking about doing something special this November, so stay tuned. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Uh, please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and keep coming back for more content. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks, Alan.